informatics career with your Drexel degree. And before we begin the discussion this afternoon, I'd briefly like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Kevin Baumlin is currently the Chief Medical Affairs Officer at the Science Center. He is boarded in both emergency medicine and clinical informatics. This is Kevin. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> true story. Uh, Dr. Adam Glassifer is the founder and principal of Vertex Health, where he works to help companies succeed in building, using, and deploying healthcare technology. He is board certified in both pediatrics and clinical informatics and proudly holds a Master of Science in Health Informatics from CCI. So with that, please help me welcome both Dr. Baumlin and Dr. Glassifer. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. So we're going to banter kind of back and forth. Uh, I thought I'd introduce myself a little bit further. Um, my, actually, I'm a Hahnemann graduate, which is Drexel, uh, Drexel Med School in 1991. I went to grad school for a year um, before that. Uh, but my journey in computer science uh, starts way before that in a high school class where we did punch cards in 1981. Probably way, way, way long ago for you to even imagine that. I took a computer science... Most, most of them probably weren't born. They were, none of you were yeah. born. That's okay. Um, I was born. So you were? I was. Really? Yes. Huh. I didn't know you were that old. Actually. I am. There you go. Um, I'm the last of the baby boomers. I'm 64. So there you go. Probably older than their grandparents in the room. But anyway, uh, in grad school, I took another computer science course. Uh, I was doing a master's in human physiology, mainly because I, I, uh, my grades weren't good enough in college to get into med school. So I took a post, post back. Did you go straight through? I, no, I actually did the same thing. Did you really? Actually, at Hahnemann. <laughs> oh my god, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Um, and and that, as part of that course, there was a little sign up that said, we could give you some cash if you uh, learn this code to write something called computer assisted instruction. And I was like, poor, waiting tables at multiple restaurants, going to grad school, and I needed the cash. I was like, I could learn the code. How hard could that be? So I learned the code and wrote a bunch of different uh, applications, uh, one for the lipid cycle, one for um, uh, the Krebs cycle, uh, then the neuroanatomy of the brainstem using something called HyperCard, which was the first language that, for an apple. We had these little things, boxes called Mac SEs. Do you remember them? A little, bit, little handle on the top, kind of carried around. It was like this big. Um, and I decided I, in medical school, that I was in medical school, that I wanted to start my own software company. Brilliant, stupid idea. Um, so I got a little money from some people and started Sunrise Software Solutions as a medical student. Went to Wharton SBDC, uh, which was the Small Business Development Center. I don't think it's there anymore. They have one at Temple, correct? Yeah. And was going to be an entrepreneur and a doctor, so I thought. You ever hear that story before? No. We no? achieved one of those things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I failed miserably and my uh, desire to sell my software. It wasn't quite there yet. Uh, we needed PCs. There wasn't portable. It was before the internet. It didn't exist. So in order to do uh, asynchronous learning, you had to come to the library literally at different times. One of my other jobs was working in the library. So to me, it was like, I'm here anyway. Why not learn? Uh, but to everybody else, they found time, but it wasn't, we weren't there yet. Um, so anyway, so I went and did my residency in emergency medicine in the Bronx and did nothing in computer science at all, just sort of tried to survive being in the Bronx for three years taking care of patients, which was uh, in the early 90s and was really hard. Where'd you do your residency? Uh, DuPont, Jefferson. Oh, that was... I was doing very different things in the early 90s. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and most of them still probably weren't born. But, yes. Uh, Anyway, but I went to uh, work at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York in the mid-90s, and because I had a background in computers, I was the computer guy. So, of course, I knew everything there was about computer science, which meant relatively nothing. Um, since I knew how to code, I didn't know anything about electronic health records, but I was anointed uh, the chair of the computer committee in the early 90s and set out trying to pick an electronic health record for the emergency department at the time. And that was fun, but it was just about the beginning of the internet, and it was this cool kind of place to be. But I was an academic, and I was writing papers, and my research was focused on stroke and not informatics, because my chair said, I'm not giving you any protected time or money to play with computers. That's what he said. 
So it was all on my free time that I developed the first fellowship in emergency medicine informatics uh, a long time ago and went on to um, help implement not only a best of breed electronic health record, also created something called Handy Stroke, which was, we had these things called Palm Pilots, remember them? I do. Right. They should rule the world. That's a great they example of the a coolest thing failed ever. technology company. Actually. They had some really cool features with yeah. a little stylet, had its own little language. You could really easily exchange um, business cards, which was something we still don't do as well as we did with Palm Pilots at these back then. Um, and I thought I was going to do the next thing, was have a whole series of handy uh, education tools, handy, handy derm, handy bone, handy stroke. Handy stroke was all about making sure that we gave the correct information, uh, uh, dose of, of medication to a patient who had a stroke, because there's lots of ways you can actually mess it up really badly, and you could actually kill someone if given the wrong dose. So I thought, I'm going to help out my colleagues by creating this thing. Anyway. Um, I, uh, throughout my career, I was maintaining the interest in informatics. I became the associate chief medical information officer at Mount, uh, officer at Mount Sinai. Implemented systems. I actually did have a company, not a software company, but a consulting company. I walked all over the country doing shoulder by shoulder training for docs as they implement electronic health records because docs hated me. They didn't want to put anything in the computer. They wanted to scribble on these pieces of paper, illegible handwriting, caused lots of errors because there were tons of medication errors because you couldn't read my handwriting, penicillin from amoxicillin. Is your handwriting any good? It's decent. Decent? Mine's really decent. bad. Um, anyway, and worked on all kinds of incredibly cool projects, RFID projects where we tried to find the IV pole. Can you imagine finding IV poles in a hospital? If you don't know, that's a really big thing in hospitals because the nurses hoard them because you need them all the time. Um, physical stuff operations and flow as long as integrating clinical decision support into electronic health records, which means trying to figure out how docs can do what you want them to do without them knowing you want them to do it. Um, because as a leader now, as a leader, and I was running the emergency department, I was vice chair of operations, soon to be chair of operations and chair of the department, there's lots of stuff that we really want people to do, but we don't want to be constantly in their face trying to get them to do it. So we tried our best to help them nudge them along the way. Uh, I came here back to Pennsylvania to be chair of emergency medicine at Pennsylvania Hospital and then decided for some reason I wanted to run for U.S. Senate and did that for a year and came here to the Science Center, which is right on the fourth floor uh, and I'm the chief medical affairs officer at the Science Center. What I do there is I work with all kinds of startups uh, and I love it. I'm the happiest I've ever been in my career, which sounds so weird after caring for thousands and tens of thousands of patients when they're at their worst moments in their lives. And now I'm trying to solve healthcare um, problems from a different way. I felt like I just wasn't getting anywhere from within the healthcare system. I was banging my head against the wall. And I was having the same conversations over and over again. Like, how come the, the otoscope in room 20 doesn't work? Didn't we change the light bulb? Can we please have LED bulbs instead of incandescent bulbs? And can you move the plug to where it doesn't run into the back of the stretcher? Like, over and over again, constantly. The answer is no, <laughs> all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> um, the same conversations over and over about staffing and boarding and that means people hanging out in the ER waiting to go upstairs and so now I feel like I'm having an impact and actually making a difference. I'm working with, for instance, a company that's able to detect uh, cancer 97% of the time by just using a face mask. People blowing it for five minutes and having trained Labradors smell that face mask. So cool. We're scaling them up right now and we're really thinking we're going to be a big thing. Uh, I'm working with uh, another, other tech companies um, that work in all different aspects of the space. We'll talk about a little bit more after I introduce my colleague, Adam. Tell us about your long, illustrious You career. could tell this is going to be really formal. Uh, <laughs> also, Kevin and I know each other, which makes it even less formal. Um, so whenever I kind of am in this sort of venue, uh, talking to students or residents, I always like to point out, I'm supposed to be a pediatric allergist, okay? Which um, at the time sounded great. Uh, now, thinking back, it sounds kind of terrible. I, I almost don't even like when those patients come to the ER. But <laughs> the reason I point that out is, you know, Kevin and I took very similar yet somewhat nuanced different paths to get where we are. And part of that is kind of like staying open-minded as you like see these different forks in the road. Um, so unlike Kevin, I was always into tech, but uh, never in like a formal fashion. Um, I'm a Philly guy, grew up around here, 
went to school not too far away, went to med school at Jefferson, did my training around here. Um, but uh, my, so when I was a resident, I started volunteering uh, as a pediatrics resident, just helping with order sets. Very basic, like I, I didn't really know what any of that stuff was. I just liked it and- What's an order set? That's a good point. Sorry, I forgot my credit. I know what an order set is. So within electronic health records, there are order sets built to kind of streamline care. So if I'm admitting a patient for asthma, right, you know, I can just rapidly go through orders. Sounds very easy. It's actually very complex in order to build. You mean you click a little way. box? Yes, I click How many boxes. little boxes do you have to click to get it done? A lot. Annoyingly. A lot. We as docs count our clicks. So if something takes 10 clicks, you're really agitated. If something takes five clicks, you're a little less. If it takes two, you have a happy doctor group. He's being kind. I think doctors are generally agitated regardless. But, um, so, I, um, so I left residency, went to work uh, in the virtual health system as a pediatric hospitalist. Um, was my first choice for allergy fellowship was great hospital in Kansas City, Children's Mercy. Uh, didn't get selected right off the bat. And uh, about halfway in, they called me that they're, I don't know, they had three spots and I was their fourth choice and someone dropped out. And they were like, they're like, oh, so we'd love to offer you the spot. And I was like, yeah, I'm good. Like <laughs> just on the spot. And I remember going home, I told my wife and she was like, we just spent like all that time, did you ask? And I was like, I don't know, like things are good. Did you really want to move to Kansas City? <laughs> um, so. Not a Chiefs fan, are you? Uh, no, I mean, I'm a Philly guy, so I'm diehard everything here. Uh, and when I started working in the health system, uh, I volunteered a little bit more. So, like, they had clinical systems. They were actually just moving to electronic uh, computer physician uh, order entry. And I had never handwritten an order before that. I came from academic institutions. So I just helped out, got more and more immersed into that over time. Uh, you know, what started as volunteer work ended up as, you know, part-time paid work with the IT department, which then grew into um, uh, more of a role there. And this is all while I'm providing clinical care as a hospitalist. So um, doing inpatient work, working with the pediatric ICU, the pediatric floor, pediatric emergency room. And over time, that essentially grew into, uh, I became a part-time informatics support, and then eventually became the associate CMIO for the health system. So um, does anyone know what a CMIO is? All right, so a CMIO, and again, I, that's We were both I, CMIOs. Yeah, right? so CMIO is a chief medical information officer. And in the most basic forms, you are the bridge between the clinical and technical worlds. You live in both of them. So you are delivering care up front, so you know the pain of implementing technology, but then you understand the basic elements of technology on the back end as well. So did you learn the code? Did you like go off to Epic Land in Verona? I, I am a certified physician builder, but I, I know just enough to be dangerous. But what I do know is I know that when the, the technical teams come to me and say they can't do it, I can tell them, oh, I yes. know you can do it. Oh, yes, you can. Here's generally how you can do it. I can't do it, but I, so, which there's value in. Um, in the setting of that, um, I started, uh, and I'm glossing over lots because I don't want to take too much time, but. Uh, started Virtuous Telehealth program from inception. It was actually based on a failed startup business model that uh, I worked on with a colleague at CHOP. Um, and then ended up becoming, so in the setting of that role, led large scale implementations like Kevin, like electronic health records, voice recognition technology, lots of other um, clinical uh, tools. And then I launched the Center for Innovation there and became the chief innovation officer there. So worked a lot with the evaluation of emerging technologies and trying to integrate them into uh, clinical workflows. Uh, more often than not unsuccessfully, but learning just as much from the um, unsuccessful ones from the ones that were successful. And from there I started advising uh, startups and venture capital firms on the side just by virtue of what I was doing. Uh, so really that was most of my career and then in July of 2020 I left and uh, went to Amazon where I worked at Amazon Web Services and uh, so my role... When did you get your master's? Uh, that's a good point. Yeah, I skipped that. Uh, yeah, I skipped it. That's uh, here. I got yeah. my master's in 2017. I had to look it up. I couldn't even remember. Um, and actually one of, one of the things, first off, I know that I'm here and it's going to sound like I'm like shilling for the university, but very <laughs> genuinely it was an unbelievable experience. and. Oddly for me, I was getting the degree for the job I already had, 
which like was very backwards. I was already the associate CMIO, right. um, and I was getting my boards, and um, the this prepared me very well for those boards, and also um, for the rest of my career. But it was interesting. I was able to do it part time. I took like one class at a time because you know I was working as a clinician and you know as in a enterprise operational role. Um, you mentioned boards in clinical informatics, so that's a route that we both took. I grandfathered, and I was like the first year, so I'm like the grandfather of clinical informatics, yeah, I, I guess. I'm not a grandfather. But, uh, um, it was the only boards I ever took that I passed on my first try. Me too. Oh, no, I passed P's on the first try. <laughs> I didn't. I was, I'm a miserable test taker. I am too. But it, because it was all stuff that we knew because we were doing it, you know, we were like in charge of all this stuff. So it's like relatively, compared to emergency medicine boards, yeah. and the breadth of that, relatively easy. Um, so anyway, so I, I interrupted you yet again. That's but I do want to talk more about AWS sure. and landing there and what the heck did you do there and why do we have a doc at AWS? So, there, so I'll share a bit about my team. I can share broadly about the landscape there and, and some of the, there are a lot of doctors there actually. Um, <laughs> So what I did at AWS, I led a global business development team that helped healthcare startups uh, get customers and, and drive their adoption. So um, we, my, my team started uh, from inception, the AWS Healthcare Accelerator Program, which uh, ran five cohorts globally uh, in the UK, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, we ran global ones, uh, focused ones in the US, uh, helped a lot of startups gain some go-to-market traction. Uh, so most of the companies we worked with were slightly more mature. They weren't like your people tinkering in a garage. They had, you know, uh, validated solutions, some revenue, and some paying customers. And what percent doc versus tech were these companies? So what's the ratio approximate of the peeps in these startups? Like the people starting them? The, the uh, people starting them and the people working for them in the early stages. So there's like eight questions buried in there. Um, I'll, try to, I'll try to address all of them. So it's very varied. I will say uh, doctors make not great founders in my experience. Um, A little distracted, are they? Well, more so, uh, the right, let me say the right kind of doctor makes the right founder. They need to be listening to the team, especially at those early stages. And um, so it's a very varied group. A lot of the startups we worked with were people that saw problems that they wanted to try and fix, which um, when you work backwards from that, it's, it's definitely a higher likelihood of success, right? What do you mean, that's an important point here, what do you mean when you work backwards, do you, specifically? Do you mean like you have a really cool tech idea and then you want to use that to solve something? Is that what that, you mean? No, that's way harder. I, I, you're leading me, I appreciate that. <laughs> I, that's way harder to do, is like, I have a technology I want to work on, what am I going to use it for? as opposed to like we're, so for example, we're talking about healthcare here, right? You're all patients, right? You've all been a patient in some fashion. Um, and like, I'm sure you've seen problems throughout that process. So people that see those issues and just pick one to lock on. So for example, uh, one of the companies that we worked with uh, was a woman who she had several miscarriages and helped to start a company to try and help that using AI and do some predictive analysis up front by pulling in lots of different um, clinical data, um, demographic data, things like that, you know, seeing where those issues lie. And then some of them are really fundamental, you know, how do, how do you get to and from appointments, right? That's incredibly difficult. We had a company that, that looked at that, non-emergent medical transport. So, I think it's a really important point because some of the social determinants of health that we focus so much on now in healthcare um, are, are absolute paramount to better wellness, or I like to say better health and better care makes better healthcare. So if you have an idea that works to improve care and you're a technical person, that's a great idea. That doesn't mean that you're a healthcare startup, but it can improve people's lives, especially if you think about transport of older adults. How do older adults get to and from the doctor? Any of you have older adults in your lives? Someone's got, no one? No one doesn't know them? I do, I, my parents are in their 80s, so getting them back and forth to appointments alone can be a monumental day-long task. So if one of Adam's companies can solve that, we're, we're all gonna invest. Yeah, and, and we right? would focus on different um, high level, so we did one on health equity, we did one on workforce solutions, which I know, you know, we could talk about ad nauseum. Um, and 
so we, we helped a lot of these companies, and of course all the companies they're building on the AWS platform. So um, you know, we're helping them also with the technical elements of their infrastructure, their build, how they're gonna expand, but then really focused on the go-to-market aspects. How do they fundraise? How do they um, sell into the markets that they want to? And surprisingly, so especially for this group, if you're building a healthcare solution, it always would blow my mind where, I mean, I've been pitched by probably thousands of startups at this point, and they'll pitch something, they're so excited, every startup's excited, they're changing the, the face of healthcare, and, you know, which realistically is, you know, impossible to do, and, you know, you can do it in pieces. Um, but they'll pitch something, and we were talking about this before, I'll look at it and be like, did you have anyone, any user or clinical person in this involved that, that's gonna use this product? And be like, well, no, but they're gonna use it. I'm like, nobody's gonna use it the way that you've designed it or built it. So similar to how you know, clinical people need technical people around them, if you're a technical team, you gotta make sure that you have those clinical insights and your end user um, involved early, so very, very early. What are some of the skills that some of these students here can bring to the table for a healthcare startup? Besides, we all know that they're gonna end up, because they're all geeks, and I like to say being a geek is a six-figure word, right? Um, the, the data shows that, especially in the greater Pennsylvania area, that your potential for job earnings is in the $100,000 range soon after you graduate. What are, what are the startups looking for to hire these, hundred, these earners that are going to make good salaries in the near future, even if they don't go to work for Amazon or whoever? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends, you know, taking like the Amazons and Googles out of the world. Um, of the world out of it. Um, it depends on the startup that you're going to, and part of that is like figuring out like what is your skill set, right? Are you a full stack developer? Are you focused on AI? Are you cyber focused? All, all of those things are super, super valuable skills. But kind of depends, you know, where you are in the stage of startup, right? Like if you're a full stack developer and you truly have skill all along, that is huge for early stage startups. Now. How you'll get paid for that is a whole different story and something we'll probably come back to. But, but those are, you know, it's all about finding the niche where you can add value. So whatever your technical skill is, um, there are startups out there that 100% need you. Like, it, it's not all AI or, or nothing, um, which I think is important. As much as that has become ubiquitous in the tech space and even in healthcare, um, there is a ton of... Uh, a ton of opportunity. So would you say they should follow what they think the trend is in their training and education or follow what they want to do? Uh, well, this, so I have, uh, I have two answers to this. So <laughs> I would say one, uh, follow what you're passionate about and what interests you because like you can't fake it. Uh, and it goes back to how I started this, right? Like I'm supposed to be something completely different than I am now. So following where those interests take you but what I would say is at the same time, definitely getting the foundational knowledge to stay current on what are hot topics, um, if that makes sense. It probably sounds like I hedged my bets on that answer. But No, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, one of the hot topics right now in healthcare is workforce. Um, by that we mean that, especially during the COVID crisis, I myself stopped practicing clinical medicine. Uh, the stress after 30 years was... Um, unbearable, yeah. um, running a department and having uh, lots of lives of workers uh, um, who were incredibly disrupted. Uh, the emotional toll was overwhelming. I have a little PTSD, can you tell? Um, anyway, uh, it's estimated that 40% of my colleagues in emergency medicine will leave emergency medicine in the next two years. Uh, of the nurse workforce, there's hundreds of thousands of nurses that haven't returned to the workforce because they're just too stressed out. The question is, how can all of you in the room make their lives better? What are some of the ideas you have to maybe decrease workplace violence in, in, in the emergency department? Improve how nurses administer medications so that they're error-free 100% of the time and easier to give, because the stress of giving the wrong dose of medication, I, I, I don't know if you can imagine that, but giving someone an overdose of insulin just because you measured the medicine wrong in a syringe, you're potentially killing someone? And, and this is important. I, keep me honest here. Yeah. Medical errors, what, what is it, third leading cause? Somewhere in there, I don't know. I, I can't remember the exact number, but 
but it is like in like the top five to 10 of causes of death in the United States. So again, there is tremendous opportunity to improve upon that. Um, and to Kevin's point, you know, the other part is you're all patients. So even though this sounds like really abstract, like when you need care, these people aren't gonna be there because yeah. technology has, well, it's not just technology, it's technology and operations has kind of crushed their soul a bit. Yeah. So how do we crush it less? Yeah, I was on a call this morning with a group of Israeli startups and, and one of the folks was saying that, you know, doctors only get to spend 10 minutes with the patient and I thought, 10 minutes? How luxurious to be able to, <laughs> what's the last time you got to spend 10 full, undisrupted minutes in a room with a patient? Uh, if I'm doing it, something, is ba something bad is happening. <laughs> something, so, someone's coding. Well then, if, if I'm doing chest compressions, yeah, yeah. maybe. But not if I'm doing an a interview, because you're, you're expected to have a productivity measure of, I say, in my world, 2.5 to 2.6 patients around there, up to three patients per hour. The work of interviewing a patient is much less time than the work of documenting that encounter and ordering all the stuff you have to do and making all the endless amount of phone calls and busy work you have to do in order to care for that one life. So the question is, Adam, can we fix it? No. <laughs> uh, but we can make it better. Okay. This, this is like part of how I like to approach things. Like even when I ran my team at Amazon, like. We're, we're never gonna be perfect. And this is what holds startups up, up a lot. So it's like a broad, you're never gonna be perfect, but you can try to achieve perfection. You know, we can make it better. We can come as close to that as possible with the full acceptance is not gonna be perfect. So like, what are the decisions that are two-way doors, right? Like we can back out of, and like, what are the ones that are one-way doors where like, we better not mess this up? So talk about um, nuance, uh, ambient technologies and making Alexa for healthcare um, with LLM so much better that a doctor-patient encounter is simply at the end of the encounter. Uh, Are you a believer? Am I a believer? Uh, yes. So for me... <laughs> that was hesitating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there are companies really doing this interestingly, uh, which uh, you know, I'm not associated with, so I'll avoid some... I just, out of my own personal interest, how many people in this room have an Alexa voice recognition device in their home? That's it. How about their parents' home? Huh. I thought it would be more than that. I, I did too, actually. I'm kind of surprised. Uh, Google Home has limited market share. So. Anyone have Google Home? Really? Oh, whoa! Sorry, I didn't okay, mean to call so we, you out and shame. We got our percent up to maybe 65, 70%. Um, so I'm an anti-Alexa person. I don't like, even though I realize that people are listening to me on my phone, I try and... I, I just accept the convenience of all of it, and there's nothing that exciting about me that I'm hiding. So, <laughs> uh, for, you know, ambient listening is huge and has a lot of potential, especially when mixed with, um, with AI. Now, for me, the holy grail of like geeky informatics and technology, which I don't know if we've talked about this, but I'm certain that we agree, is like, can I go in, so I still see patients once a month. I work in a pediatric ER in southern New Jersey just to you know, keep my skills up, do a little one-to-one -one fixing of things still. And, um, the holy grail is for me to be able to go in, talk to the patient, do my thing, and walk out, and all of the soul-crushing things that Kevin is talking about, they're done for me. They're just done, right? I need to check them, right? Because there still needs to be a human involved and quality control and you know, safety, but um, they're all done. And it is possible. No one has stuck the landing on this, but um, I, I do think, and, and we're starting to see some, some interesting improvements um, in that space, but that is, when someone does that, they will, just take the market. You think we'll ever get to the place where a doc can, can verbally say, I want, um, I want XYZ medication, uh, 10 of prednisone, um, yeah. and a nebulizer in room four, and that to be administered correctly without error by a nurse provider? Yes. God, you're so, in, in our you lifetimes? Don't, you don't? 
Really? Maybe Before I'm, lifetime. I'm like gonna be sixty this Maybe year. Maybe my life. I doubt it. I, I mean, like, I'm an old guy. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I do think. Really? We'll that. I do. Maybe I with these guys help, like maybe. Maybe I mean, the, the challenge is healthcare is naturally so risk averse. Mm -hmm. So you know, they are you know historically very slow to adopt innovation. So you see like the fintech worlds or like defense. So part of the super cool part of my one of the super cool parts of my job at Amazon, I worked on a cross-functional team. So while I led the healthcare vertical, um, I worked hand in hand with uh, a team that did space defense and sustainability. Um, and ran the same functions. We helped startups, we ran accelerators. So we would get into like all these like weird conversations like about like chest compressions in space and weird things like that. But w what you'll find is like these innovations are happening in all the all different industries trying to attack very similar yet different problems. So some of the solutions can be multi-use, some are very specific, but so uh, someone made a comment in a conference I was at earlier um, that uh, electronic health records and chief medical information officers are the, are the people you talk to and the places you go if you want your tech company to die. Um, is that just because there's such a huge market share for Epic? Epic is a large electronic health record. A company that's based in lovely Verona, Wisconsin, which I'm sure we've both, I spent it, many months, yeah, many It's actually nice out there. It's beautiful. Yeah. They have great cheese curds and beer if you're not yet a beer fan, but cheese curds are interesting. Um, now you made a oh, funny face. No, I like cheese curds. Do you? Okay. And beer. <laughs> I like beer too. <laughs> anyway, it's an incredible, if you ever get the opportunity just to go to explore a career path, there's like, Drexel says, we're going to do a road trip to Madison, Wisconsin and go out to Verona. It's cool. I mean, and it's a, the ethos of the company to be with young college grads, mostly college grads yeah. who are really working on the technical side of electronic health record with some folks like Adam and I uh, as physician leads, uh, striving towards solutions to make their product better, more integrated, and have better ways of delivering the new age of digital solutions. Do you think that Judy, who's the CEO, she's a little crazy, um, will ever get there? Get where? To the place where it's easy to integrate into Epic instead of impossible. Uh, I think though it's becoming easier. Okay which is a very vague answer, but um, <laughs> you know, Epic is the best of what is a challenge technology. Um, and they come out of the box and they rely on innovation of other companies to often take things to the next level. But I mean, they're highly successful and there is a lot, a lot of opportunity for, for, for startups. E even to add on, I think, the, the key part of, I think, what Kevin's alluding to is um, an electronic health record is the single biggest investment that any health system makes. Um, so when you're working in a health From system... From a capital and operating budget, would you say? Yes. And, but what that means, the capital budget is the cash dollars they spend for stuff, and operating budget is the, the how dollars How much it is to spend, buy, how much it is to run. How much it is to run. So the, the, the number of FTs, meaning full-time equivalents, employees needed to maintain, change, develop, enhance electronic health record is a huge huge, huge line item in any healthcare systems budget. And therefore, it's a big full idea. If you're tinkering with it, messing with it, engaging in the security behind it, you have to think really hard. And Adam and I were the docs in the room having to make these really tough decisions. Most of the times I said no. I don't know about you. Um, I tried. Uh, <laughs> um, sadly, because you're talking about people who are our friends, who are out there as innovators, creatives, wanting to bring solutions to us, and we have to say no, mainly for security reasons and for our, our standards around how long that company's been in business. If your standard is that company has to be five years in business in order for us to even look at your uh, RFP uh, response, request for proposal, meaning the, the documents you submit when you're submitting uh, for that particular idea, it's brutal. Yeah, and I think you know when we talk to a lot of startups, so part of going back to that is, Often the question is, if, you know, let's say, like in my chief innovation officer role, I was, you know, pitching a startup that we wanted to try and bring into the ecosystem. First question is, well, does Epic do that? Because again, it's a single biggest investment. Like, are we, are we already paying for it? And if the answer is no, then, okay, well, does it integrate with Epic? So can the people working in there 
get the information they need and can it tie in? And those are really important elements because typically if it doesn't do either of those things, it's, it's, it's even more difficult. So um, understanding, you know, like for all of you, if you're building startup solutions or technologies, understanding where it fits into the broader landscape is critical in understanding your business, um, your, the return of investment that your potential customers are gonna get. Like you have to understand where they're sitting um, because even if you have the greatest idea in the world, if it doesn't fit into the workflow or the operations, it's, ne it's never gonna happen. Let's talk AI. So what are the, like I, I kind of giggle when people think AI is like this thing that just happened all of a sudden. You know, and I did my uh, informatics uh, rotation in med school, which was, I guess, 1989 or 90 at the Brigham. I was working on um, neural networks for breast uh, cancer detection, and that was quite a while ago. Um, and we thought it was cool, and we thought we were just on the cutting edge, and we're going to make you know, this artificial intelligence of being able to diagnose breast cancer. This is like 1989. The fact that we're at close enough to adoption, would we say we're there? Of, of AI? Of, of AI and breast cancer detection? Oh, and breast cancer. Uh, probably, yeah, we're, like, I would say in breast cancer there. detection. Breast and easy. plain film, radiography. Yeah, pathology. I, think, I don't know if we're there in pathology. Getting there. I'm gonna push back on that. Getting there. But, but we're using I, machine learning good company. in order to recognize these patterns because we have enough data, enough super computing power, whereas then, we didn't have the power to do the analytics as fast as we do now. So these cool things that we thought we were gonna be able to do if we just had this physical room of <laughs> literally, <laughs> now is on a chip this big. Or it's in the cloud. Yeah, and that's unbelievable. I don't even know if I thought we'd get there, um, but we're there. But what's the next promise of AI? What's the next promise of AI using all this data that we now have because some of us were advocates for electronic health records uh, pretty intensely. Um, what do you think? Is that the big space of AI that everyone who's in a computer science program should be looking at? Data, 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 data? Well, I, you know, one of the, when I, when, when I talk with startups, one of the things we always talk about is your, your data is probably one of your best assets and what you do with it um, because it can help your platform. There are ways to monetize it. I mean, there, there's, there's lots of things. So I think what's important is having a strong data strategy because you know, garbage in, garbage out. So that's great, you build some like, great model, but if your, your data's not clean, it's gonna come out as garbage and not be actionable. So just talking about that for just one second because we are in the middle of West Philadelphia in the Black Bottom community. Um, what are the issues around data? Why do people say like, we're building these data models with bad data? Why is that? Why do people talk about that? From an equity standpoint? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, if you're building solutions that are supposed to help people's outcomes, you have to have representative data models. So, you know, making sure that data sets have you know, the full socioeconomic racial gamut so that we're able to actually learn the things we need to learn about the specific types of people that we're treating and not just basing decisions off of, you know, white males, which, you know. I right, so the, the, the large, wealthy health systems that can afford Epic, because super expensive, uh, get data from large populations of wealthy white people, and therefore they might be coming to conclusions on data sets for populations that are skewed to a demographic, whereas less rural, less minority, less impoverished hospitals are behind the curve, catching up, to be fair. Uh but our delayed implementation, therefore the, the learning that happened on those models isn't as, um, as, non, as diverse as it should be. Yeah, I, mean, I was looking at my words closely, you, I tried. You would, you would <laughs> hope, and we both know this is not true, that they, you know, these places have data strategies, right? And they, they know that they need to use representative data sets, not just for their actual population. That's not true. I, it, you're fibbing. Well, I'm not fibbing. I think in some places they're good about this, but, but in general, this is not happening. Um, so, so it's a legitimate concern and a worry. Well, it's a legitimate concern. And, you know, there's also, you know, bias in AI in general has, is, that is not new. I mean, I think now it's a little more at the forefront because AI is like everywhere. But, um, yeah, I mean, you can create biased models that just perpetuate 
the same things that we see in society. So, uh, you know, I think it's important, uh, especially like for the people in this room, right? You're all young, you're gonna be in the rooms. So it's like asking those questions if you're helping train those models or pulling in data sets or building platforms. Like, are you building things that are, you know, representative of the people that are gonna benefit from it? Which is important. But, but I think in general, AI has a lot of promise in healthcare. Right now, it, it's because it's all happening. Like, AI's been used in healthcare for a long time, but all of a sudden, now with large language models, everything is moving so fast, everyone's so into it, it's a little bit like Wild West. Like, in some ways, for organizations that aren't like really on top of this and creating like policies and like finding ways for their clinicians to, to responsibly use it, I promise you there are docs or nurses or techs that are just like using chat GPT to deliver clinical care, which, you know, I think has, I mean, that's a whole separate discussion, but, you know, th there's concerns about that. So I think, you know, seeing some of these health systems get like really out in front of this is great. Um, and I think eventually it'll, it'll get there where it's really helping people and streamline. But you, you really need to have um, operations, which, this sounds like super lame, but like you have to have operations and policies in place to you know, make sure that things are being used responsibly. But the potential for young graduates to be the smartest person in the room in this, this topic is extraordinary, don't you think? I do, and I think the opportunity is great because, um, you know, and, and I think that comes to, you know, you may find yourselves in these rooms and you have to be comfortable to speak up when you see something out of space. So, um, you know, one of the things that I always say, like, as your career goes, you'll find yourself in situations where you're like, I don't know, should I really be here doing this? You know, like, uh, and, and I think it's important, you know, just to kind of generally, like, act like you've been there before, right? If you have something that you think is of value, I, I think you, you speak up, because that's how, that's how progress happens. Um, and that's also how you can stand out, certainly, as a, you know, young grad or young technical resource on a larger team. Uh, do, we, uh, do we think, both of us think, we talked about large language models a little bit and the, the power of the positive and the caution to be had in that space. Um, can AI in and of itself or AI tools improve not just the lives of the workforce but patients' lives? Can, can, we, can we decrease uh, um, maternal child mortality because of AI? I think eventually. You're more skeptical, I could tell. Do you think that? I'm older. I'm, I'm, grand, I'm supposed to be a little bit more skeptical. Yeah. Right, age. But do you think that can happen? Uh, I, I, I truly do, honestly. I don't know. I, I, I don't, the, the emergency physician seen too much of life in me Understanding the the systemic racism in our society, the poverty, the the lack of education, the the um, the pushback for making the lies of all, the the, the lack of virtue and the, the the too much me in our society makes me skeptical. Not that I don't want to do everything. I've tried all kinds of things to try and make things better. Uh, I guess the question is, can we, can we harness this power to target real good? Because in every class of young students, I find when I talk to students, they want to do good stuff. They want to change the world. And how can we use our scientists, our computer scientists, can we inspire them to take their brains, their abilities, and do good and really help patients? That was very uplifting. Was it? So I think the message here is prove Kevin wrong. Um, no, I mean, it goes back. There, prove there, Adam right, even yeah. better. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think there, there's, you know, this is a really exciting time to be entering into tech, technology. And even if your focus is in healthcare, I think just in general, the applications, uh, you know, of technology in every single vertical is um, booming, you know, again space, defense, sustainability, fintech. I mean, whatever your, wherever your interest lies, there's opportunity. Um, and I think it's finding where that space is and finding, you know, like where can you make that impact and make a difference? And like, I don't know, maybe you just 
want to start a company and make a lot of money, uh, which you know is a longer way to make impact. But I'm sure there. Are so there's nothing wrong with making money. I'm not going to be negative on that, um, because we want people to rise up because of a good education. That's important. Um, along the way, just before we uh, a couple things before we open it up to questions, some of the students in the room are going to say, "I'm going to go work for a startup, and I'm going to take." 5% equity position, or 0.4% equity position more likely. Like who gets that deal? That's only on TV shows, right? Uh, if you're gonna get your standard 0.4 for the sake of conversation, right? Um, what kind of salary cut am I gonna have to take in order to have that equity position? Is that something you would advise these young people to do? Uh, Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Explain what I'm talking about. So if you're working with, uh, generally with a startup, uh, typically, cash poor, depends on the stage, of course. Um, but if you're coming in early, you know, typically you'll get some piece of equity. If you're coming in later, you'll typically still get some. Um, and depending on when you come in, the salary that they'll pay you is likely not commensurate. What does that mean, piece getting. of equity? What does that mean? So it's essentially a stake in the company. So you are basically saying, hey, I'm gonna work here for whatever amount of money that you're gonna give me, and then this lottery ticket that uh, I'll cash in if the company sells or you know, gets, you know, goes public and sells stock, and, um, which you know, those likelihoods are pretty low. So, you, you know. What percent actually make it? I, you know, I actually don't know the number offhand, but so, it's. So like, let's say 10%, 90% right. fail. Yeah. So if you're that risk person who just loves to gamble and risk and you love your own ideas and you think you can pick out the good ones, even though you're young and haven't lived the world yet, um, then go for that. Uh, if not, you might want to make a little bit of a higher salary without the equity position and learn a little first. Um, because you probably all have to pay off your student loans, like me. I, I just finished a couple of years ago. I don't know about you. I, Biden you finished yet? mine, so. <laughs> oh, I didn't have Joe Biden when I was amazing. paying mine off, I'm just That's saying. All, yeah. But I just finished a couple of years ago. It's been a very long time to pay off my loans. And so <laughs> the thought of not going out there and making money was like, no. <laughs> Show me the paycheck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you got to think about that and think about where you are and, and what, what your decisions might be as, when you enter into the job one. Yeah, I think for those of you that are going to go into the startup space, whether it's working for one or uh, starting your own, it is really important to assess your personal risk tolerance. And what I mean by that is some people, they're like, this is the greatest idea ever, like, I'm going all in. And others are like, you know, quite more cautious. And, and honestly, I still remember I was faced with this decision in my career where, uh, you know, I, so myself and a, I talked about it briefly before. So myself and a colleague had this pediatric telehealth concept, which, by the way, no one has nailed. Uh, <laughs> and we were finalists for the Chop Dream It competition. This is going back a long time ago. And we didn't get selected. And I remember he was a neonatologist. You know, I was a hospitalist. You know, I had family and house. And, and we looked at each other. And I was like, I can't go on in this. And he's like, I can't either. So. You know, understanding that about yourself is really, really important. There's no right or wrong answer here. It's really just like, what, like, what is your personality? Like, I that probably would have crushed my spirit. So, you know, I've realized about myself, and you know, I joked before, I'm, I'm a risk-averse entrepreneur. So most of the things that I've done in my career are with um, other people's money and investments. And you know, I've fortunately been, you know, somewhat. I don't even think that's wood, but somewhat <laughs> successful at it. Um, but, but it's important to know those things about yourself. So I certainly work with early stage companies to help support them. Um, and I have made a, you know, a couple investments here and there, but um, that's just not me. Um, so it's really important to know that about yourself as you enter the workplace. And I think factors directly into like, you know, the salary equity balance of, of what you can take. Um, and there are times where it might just be equity. So, but like realize someone is literally handing you a lottery ticket. Like that's what you're getting paid in, which, you know, could be great. Well, I think we've kind of blown up their young minds with lots of stuff and concepts. I don't even think I finished my intro, which is funny. Really? I don't need to. I just like, I enjoyed the conversation. Um, 
you, I was going to get you to talk about more of your companies at it, AWS that you're working with. But it doesn't matter. No, we'll it's all good. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts or like, eh, or just yell them out? Or, go ahead. Uh, can, oh, go ahead. Can, okay. can you also share like your name and your degree yeah, yeah. and yeah, your sure, focus? Yeah. So my name is Rohan. Uh, I'm a third year student here at Drexel, majoring in biology and minoring in computer science. Cool. Um, do you have any advice for uh, pre-medical and medical students interested in breaking into this career as a physician at some point? <laughs> uh, well, I, I think you know, the question is, what path do you go? Do you, do you go med school, informatics fellowship, um, that route? I think if you want to be a CMIO now, you need to have your formal fellowship, right? I don't uh, think the grandfather days are over or no? I think it depends. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, because uh, then the question, see, if you want to do an informatics fellowship, these, the grandpas in the room who designed these, it's like two or three years. So you won't, that's in addition to a clinical residency, which is another three to four years, depending on what you do, minimum. So that's a long road. I mean, you're well into your 30s there by the time you start making a living. It's a little rough. It depends on, you know, frankly, how wealthy your family is or what, if you have incredible tolerance for $350,000 loans um, is what it is. Yeah, I, I would say, and I would apply this broadly in general, like if you're trying to figure out how to navigate in this space, the best thing you can do is just work for free. No, no, I'm being dead serious here. Like find, you know, a company that you're super interested in just to get some experience and like, Offer to work for free. People will rarely turn down free work from like capable people, which I'm assuming you're all capable. But like, so it's a great way to get experience as you're like trying to like navigate what that path looks like because you have so many variables right now. Um, but the thing you don't have is experience. So how do you get that experience and figure out what it is that you want to do? Um, and I, that's that's a great way, and sometimes that's harder than done. But I've known people that have just like they find a company, they cold call, they find someone, and you know they use their network to yeah. find someone. Yeah. The other thing that we didn't talk about is people management, and I think that um, uh, I don't think that we talk about it enough in education. We don't talk about two things enough: accounting and and HR, and the skills associated with those two things. Because I found myself as a young leader like managing people, you move on in your career in, in computer science and tech, and the larger your team, the more respect, the more money you have. But are you learning anything about, about really people operations and managing teams of people? Like that to me was like the most boring stuff. I mean, we had to study for informatics boards. It was a whole section that I remember. And I was like, what dribble? And I hated it. But, the reality of it is it's really important stuff to learn good project management skills, good people management skills. Those things will play a pivotal role in, in, any, in any of the fields you're going into in the future. So don't leave that part of your education out no matter how you obtain it. Uh, go out and find that knowledge and, and get it and own it. Um, med school, I wouldn't want to put down med school. He's looking at us like we should be saying something good about med school. I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I took a very weird path to get here. I, I like, kind of figured out what I wanted to do very late in life, but I, I wouldn't trade it. Do so, we ever really know what we want to do? I, I don't know. I have a rough idea at this point. Rough, but... I um, think that's okay to consider life to be a journey where you're doing what makes you interested in and follow through on it and see if you're really good at it. And, you know, I started off, I went to ag school, I wanted to be a farmer, <laughs> for, for real. Um, and I was terrible at showing cows, like really bad. Um, and I went, was doing a side gig teaching autistic kids at this school for Douglas Development Disability Center, and I had this passion for autism and trying to figure out what the heck it was, and thought, maybe I want to do that. You know, it was like my side gig thing, you know, and that became my passion to, to th to think about science and think about why there are people that are different in the world and what challenges they have and how I can help them. Like, it fit me better, but I allowed myself to be open enough to go on the journey along the way that, like, I could still like cows, but yeah. I'll go don't, show don't them box day. yourselves in. They Maybe don't walk showing cows is your thing. Like, saying. who knows? <laughs> no cow showing for you, Adam? No, no, I can confidently say I'd be terrible at it. I've never done it, but. 
Um, any other questions? Thoughts, concerns, comments? Yeah. yeah. You, yeah. Uh, my name is Itai. I'm a software engineering major, and I actually just recently added a minor in data science. Um, I'm a fourth year, and my question to you guys is, what do you think about the trend in AI um, trying to tackle the one-size-fits-all approach to medicine? What, what, say again? The one-size-fits-all approach to medicine. What do you think about AI's role in tackling that? Well, I, one size is not fit all. Yeah, I was going to say, I would <laughs> argue I think AI is trying to do the opposite. Is like everything is super personalized, and it's going to be. Um, which I think is great for us as patients when it actually happens, but like that's the promise, right? So like you as an individual can walk in and you know, we can pull in all these different data points and be like, all right, this is the best treatment for Aton based on what's going on. So I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think the promise is actually a, a bit flipped there. Yeah, I think the promise is that these toxic chemotherapeutic agents that we now use for cancer treatment will be similar to the way we think about leaching uh, when at the 17th, 18th century. That they're body killing substances and we'll have targeted uh, substances that are engineered and made for you, for your body, for your disease, that target and uh, alleviate your, your likely death early from a deadly, horrible disease and have minimal side effects. Yeah, I, that I'm hopeful for. Yeah, so I actually, don't want to be like doggy negative here. They're, they're um, super they're cool companies in those spaces super too. Cool, like, like personalized pharmacogenomics or even specific to disease states or. You and know, if, here in Philadelphia is like the cool place to be. Just like if you yeah. want to get in that ecosystem space, we have some startups in that space I'm working with now on a, a large ARPA-H grant that we didn't talk about. But just say what it is. I know you can't say too much for various uh, regions. So I, yeah, I guess to wrap up. So <laughs> I end up leaving Amazon. I run a consulting advisory firm uh, working with different startup companies. But as part of that role, uh, about half of my time, I'm a senior advisor to ARPA-H, which is a, a government innovation agency um, focusing on, on advancing healthcare for all through you know, technology, science. And the precursor was DARPA. Yes, yes. Originally. And what was DARPA? Uh, DARPA was the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, so created the internet, despite what Al Gore says. Uh, but we love Al Gore. Stealth bomber, all sorts of other things. And then essentially, uh, the Biden administration two years ago decided to uh, create a healthcare focused version of that. So, and a lot of exciting things. That happen. with the cancer moonshot, I think, are really cool things that are happening right. that your generation has the incredible ability and hope, we hope. We hope. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. hope. We think. I hope. I, I don't he know knows. about you, but uh, he's more certain than I am. But um, that you'll be inspired to maybe consider <laughs> uh, a career in healthcare informatics to actually solve big problems with your incredible computing skills. So this has been really fun for us. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. Thanks for Thank having you, me. Thank you, attentive audience. I didn't see one person sleeping, and I've given a lot of lectures in my career. That must have been. Kind of interesting. I don't know. Maybe it's you, Adam. Maybe it's know. the banter that's keeping people awake or something. It's, it's the cookies the, uh, are coming. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks so much.